Hi there, welcome back to the channel. Welcome to the second video in the restoration of the Siemens Super G7. I believe it's called the Super G7, not the Gross Super G7, as someone pointed out. And this video is going to be fairly short because I've got some family chores to uh, occupy my time. But when I left off last time, I said uh, the capacitor replacements were the next point, And there was an interesting part to do with this middle section that needed to be removed. I'll show you how I did that. It actually worked out a lot easier than I thought. But there's a problem that cropped up. As you'll see, this is not working the way I expected it to be working after what I did, which is replace the capacitors. But anyway, if you enjoyed this sort of thing, stick around, enjoy my frustration, enjoy the video. This is what I've come up with. I've uh, realized that to remove or to lift this section off from the other side, I need to remove four screws. I removed them and this does in fact move, but not as much as I hoped. And I had a closer look at this and in fact what we've got on this side really is one capacitor, this guy over here. Now I can reach there if I push this back a little bit since I've removed the screws. I can get to that, uh, that leg over there and I can uh, get to this one. So I can remove this one. Now the other side poses a new challenge and that challenge is actually the capacitors under here. And if I do lift this from the back, it does give me a bit of room. There are a couple on here, which is easy enough to do, but there are two or three down here. And they're very, very difficult to get to with this thing on top. But I realized there's a way that I can not remove this guy and still get this out, which is probably what I'm going to have to do. Because if I pull this back, there are these clips over here. Where are they? Over there, there, and there. If I bend them straight, and then there are two or three more on the underside, I can actually remove this board from that, from that structure over there. And I think this will all just move out and get it out of the way so that I can get to those capacitors. Strangely enough, I looked on the web and I found a couple of reports on restoring this radio and they all complain about these capacitors down here, which is uh, strange because as they say on those reports, with all this free space over here, why the hell do they have to hide it away? Anyway, they did it, and now this is my problem, or rather my challenge, and I'm going to get on with it. Okay, let's see what this looks like in real time. This clip has come off. I push it in, hold the spring there, put that carefully aside. Now there are two screws. I'm actually going to remove, what am I going to remove? This whole thing, not just the board. So if I... I loosen that just to check that it does come out. And this one. Now there are springs on the back end that push this up. So I have to be careful. Just make sure these springs don't go flying everywhere. Oh, maybe I can lift this like this. Yeah. Not really. Now, if I do that, I can remove it from there. And this one, slip it back. Oh, they just slip back anyway. Hmm. What is holding this there? If I push that down, I'm worried about these springs at the back here that might just jump. Oh, they don't. I've got it. I've got it. Oh, that's fabulous. That is great. And the springs didn't jump everywhere. There are springs on this side. They stayed in place, which is good. There are a couple of caps there. And let me show you what we're facing here. You see those guys? There's one there. There's one there. I think that's it. I'll have to check this very carefully. I'll check all the components on here before I put all this, this back. But I think it's going to be doable. So the trick is not to try and remove that. It's to remove this guy. And it all sort of just fits back into those, through those holes. Yeah, I'm glad I filmed it. 
You probably think I filmed it to show you. Uh, yeah, I guess I did, but I think I filmed it to show me first. <laughs> There's nothing better than a bit of a film uh, recording to remind you of what it is you've done, because it can be so easy to forget, especially where springs are involved and mechanical stuff. I'm not good at mechanical stuff. All right, time to replace capacitors. And that's it. All the capacitors have been changed and I found something interesting and uh, I discovered something a little bit upsetting, but I'll tell you those one at a time. Let me show you what the result of this uh, part of the work was. These are the caps that were replaced. And just to make things interesting, these two were also there. Now they're X2 caps, safety caps, and they certainly had no place being in the audio section, but someone cut the leg off one side of uh, one of those or two of those other caps and put these across it with the blue wire just to make it easier. And I guess it works, but certainly not the right caps to go in there. So I removed these, I removed the ones they'd only half removed, and this is the result. All the yellow caps were the ones I replaced. There's one electrolytic capacitor that I replaced. It's the cathode bypass capacitor. I've left that one there that actually splits the, the high frequencies to the tweeters. That should be looked at later. There's a, a five microfarad capacitor down there, electrolytic, which is the FM discriminator cap. I actually tested that and it's perfectly fine, so I'm leaving it there. And of course, besides those, there are four down here, two there, two at the bottom, and there are two that I slept to replace, and that's these two guys over here. These two are the two caps that are on the, the mains in. They're um, basically there to filter noise going coming into the radio and going out through the mains line. I'm waiting for safety caps. What I'm going to do now, I'm just going to clip them. And then when I receive these new safety caps, oh, I can't, I can't reach down there. Never mind, I'll leave that for now. When I get the new safety caps, they're five nanofarads. I've ordered some 4.7 nanofarad ones. I'll put them in there just for good measure. But in the meantime, they're not doing any harm. They're not damaged. They're not black or leaking like some of them we are quite used to seeing. So it looks like the whole thing is ready, but there's a problem. You see, I did something stupid. I replaced these four over here and I tested it to make sure that everything was okay and it seemed to be okay. And then I went on and replaced all those. And when I replaced all those, I did not stop to test between capacitor replacements. And now what I've got is a very, very low level sound coming out. Let me show you. I've got this thing switched on, on FM. I'm going to connect the antenna to the FM. If you recall, we were getting a signal, right? We were getting on some of the FM stations. It was actually quite strong. This is what I'm getting now. And what is stranger is that it is not volume dependent. See, I can move that as much as I like. It's doing absolutely nothing. First, I thought maybe the pot was not working. So I did a quick check. There's the bottom of the pot to ground. And indeed, it is to ground. Now, if I take the wiper of the pot and I connect that to ground. It's working. OK, now let's see, where is the top of the pot? That's number three. That's 1.3 meg. That's fine. Now, if I connect the top of the pot where the signal comes in, to the wiper, I should, indeed, there we go. If the signal was coming in at the top of the pot, it should be going through to the wiper. That's not a problem. So now what I've got to find out is whether the issue is before the pot or after the pot. Various ways to do that. The simplest way is just to use a probe. Let me switch it on and show you what I mean. Oh, it's these little things that catch you out. This is the wire coming from the wiper of the pot and it meets a 10 nanofarad capacitor. And when I was touching that side of the 10 nanofarad capacitor, it's actually that one there. When I touched there, it made a hell of a lot of noise and I couldn't figure out what the hell was going on. And then look at this. This is the wire from the pot. For some reason, this thing was hanging by a thread I think maybe they cut that, or maybe I did. I'm not sure. Anyway, I think I found my problem. Let me solder that in and see if we, we get our audio back. 
Now something was still creeping through. There was still some sort of uh, sound going through, probably coupled capacitively somewhere, which is why the volume control was not having any effect. This thing was probably coupling on these wires that's going, that are going along here side by side, and that's why we were hearing something. Anyway, let me put the volume down before I forget, and uh, I'm going to solder that and then try it again. Okay. This is now reacting to the volume control. Still not very loud. Let me try AM. Shortwave. That is still very low. It is reacting to the volume control, but something's still wrong. I'll quickly replace the power tube and the preamp tube. Actually, let me just test something. Put this on pickup, put the volume on loud, and see what happens when I touch the multimeter connected to the input. That's not very loud. And I've just touched the pickup input at the back and the volume level is still low. And that, of course, is not going through this IF amplifier. So it's only going through those two. So whatever it is, it's on the output stage, on the audio stage. I'm just going to replace those before I go into any deeper diagnostics. Maybe I'll find it there. Here's an EL84. I'm going to switch this off. I'm going to use a cloth or something because this thing does get very hot. It is a power tube after all. And maybe it's just the power tube that's weak. We'll see. Put that on. Give it volume again. Let it warm up. I can see the glow of the... You know, I could go check voltages and all that, but I just want to do a quick and dirty check. Well, it's not the power tube, so switch it off. I'll put the old one back because there's nothing wrong with it, it seems. The one that I put in here, I believe, is good. I'll remove the EABC80. That doesn't get so hot. And this one is a new old stock, I believe. So we'll try that and hit it again. I think I prefer to test this on FM. It's better, but not good enough. So something is wrong with this. And unfortunately, I don't really have time to check it today. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to follow the signal backwards and try and find where it drops off. It could be two things. One is it could be a broken connection, an open connection. The other thing it could be uh, is it could be a short to ground. In other words, you can lose the signal in two ways here. One of them is that it's not getting through from A to B. And the other thing is it could be coming out of A and before it gets to B, it finds a path to ground. So it's the same thing, right? But uh, I need a bit of time. And today I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut this one short. Today I'm uh, acting as the moving man. 
I've got a fair amount of uh, small furniture and clothes and bags and all that sort of thing to move for my daughter because she's moving into her own place on the north of the island where she started working as a vet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave you for now. I'll get back to you very soon, discovering the fault, wherever that is. This is always really interesting. I don't want to rush it because I enjoy this uh, very, very much. I really do like the fault finding. It's uh, interesting and I want to document it properly and not in a hurry. So this is where I'll leave you for today. And I hope you've enjoyed that. If you have, click like, share, subscribe and all that jazz. And if you want to support the channel directly, you can do some Patreon and PayPal. Links are in the description below. So once again, thanks for watching. Bye for now. And most of all, stay sane.